Is it difficult for you to accept the fact that giants once roamed the earth alongside us? In comparison, the tallest man alive today has a height of 8 feet 3 inches or 251 centimeters. Hello everyone, in this video we will explain how the giants existed among us. But before we get started, make sure to give us a like and subscribe to receive future updates. Don't forget to click the bell icon to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Although Gideon Emmons and Henry Nichols are not considered to be among the heroes of American archaeology, the find they made on October 16, 1869 was one that that captured the attention of the entire country. When they dug three feet deep into the ground at the property owned by William Stubb Newell in the hamlet of Cardiff, New York, they hit stone. As they were excavating the area, one of them exclaimed the immortal words, I declare, some old Indian has been buried here, upon seeing the impression of a foot in the earth. Soon after, they uncovered a gigantic stone figure that measured more than 10 feet from head to toe. What Emmons and Nichols didn't know was that the stone figure was the invention of Binghamton cigar maker George Hull, who was also Newell's cousin, and that Hull and Newell had planted it there over a year before. Hundreds of people flocked to the location to witness the marvel. Newell erected a tent over it and started charging 25 cents per person to use it. Two days later, because of the overwhelming demand, he raised the price to 50 cents. Andrew White, the first president of Cornell University, would later characterize his trip to the area as follows. The roads were crowded with buggies, carriages, and even omnibuses from the city, with the lumber wagons from the farms, all laden with passengers. The sight of the behemoth was awe-inspiring. Lying in its grave, wrote White, with the muted light from the roof of the tent falling upon it, and with the limbs contorted as if it was in a death struggle, it produced a most weird effect. The atmosphere was one of deep solemnity all across the location. The guests barely raised their voices above a whisper. It was not surprising to find evidence of giants in the Americas. Cotton Mather, a Puritan from Massachusetts, had the belief that the mastodon fossils discovered in the captured area of Albany, New York, were the remains of giants who had been wiped out by Noah's deluge. The tigers that once groaned under the waters, he wrote, are now underwater. The dead bodies, lively proofs of the mosaic history. Nearly a century later, when a Connecticut farmer discovered foot-long, three-toed tracks in a sandstone ridge on his land, his pastor identified them from Noah's Raven, which had rested on the ledge and probably slept there before resuming the dangerous journey back. Thomas Jefferson had his own personal interest in fossils, and in the year 1804, he dedicated a chamber in the White House to the storage of his collection of fossils, which included bones, teeth, and tusks of extinct elephants, enormous ground sloths, and bison. Earlier, he was successful in persuading Ezra Stiles, the president of Yale College, that the remains in question belonged to animals and not giants. In a letter to a friend, Thomas Jefferson remarked, I cannot help believing that this is an animal, as well as the mammoth, are still existing. Jefferson had been captivated by the enormous claw of a ground sloth. It was believed that fossils, particularly those so-called giants, were proof of extinct living forms that had been wiped out by the flood described in the Bible. However, the theories of natural selection proposed by Charles Darwin in the middle of the 20th century call into question the idea that species never change. These views would also undermine the biblical narrative of Noah's deluge. The first edition of Darwin's On the Origin of Species was published in November 18th 1859, which was almost exactly 10 years before the Cardiff Giant was found. But what kind of effect did it have on the population as a whole? The book went into a second edition in 1860, but it was handily outsold by Samuel Smiles' self-help. The publisher, John Murray, had balked at a 500-page manuscript, fearing a financial fiasco. Murray had initially asked that Darwin cut it down and focus the work on pigeons, because everybody is interested in pigeons. Murray's fears proved unfounded. It's possible that George Hull was one of the people who read Darwin. In the year 1866, Hull visited Ackley, Iowa, in order to investigate the reasons behind his brother-in-law's tardy payment for a shipment of 10,000 cigars. While they were there, Hull, an atheist, and Reverend Mark Turk, a Methodist revivalist, got into a passionate fight. Later, Hull recounted that he had spent the night wondering about why people would believe those remarkable stories in the Bible about giants, when suddenly I thought of making a stone giant and passing it off as a petrified man. Hull's plan had been to pass off the stone giant as a petrified man. Because Hull's strategy required a high level of discretion, he chose to relocate the terrified guy outside of New York City. After returning to Iowa in June 1868, he located suitable stone near Fort Dodge and employed people to quarry out an 11-foot long slab of gypsum for him. Hull lied to them and said that the stone was intended for a monument to Abraham Lincoln that was going to be built in New York. The stone block was chiseled in Germany by a stone cutter who was sworn to secrecy 
before it was transported by train to Chicago. In November of 1868, the completed giant, which weighed close to 3,000 pounds, was transported by rail to a station close to Binghamton. It was then transported to Cardiff from that location. Gideon Emmons and Henry Nichols, who had been pointed in the direction of the location by Newell, were the ones who carried out the excavation the following October. After the finding, Hull learned that Newell had shared his knowledge of the prank with other people. Since he anticipated that the secret wouldn't be kept for very long, he decided to sell the monster to a group of merchants led by David Hunnam for a total of $23,000. Hull's timing was spot on at all times. The syndicate had the Colossus dug up and transported to Syracuse on November 5th, and then later took it on the road, traveling in a direction of New York City. P.T. Barnum, however, was looming on the horizon as a potential source of conflict. In the year 1870, Mark Twain wrote a ghost story, which was set in a hotel room in Manhattan. The story follows the appearance of a big and clumsy phantom, who is revealed to be the ghost of the Cardiff giant. The miserable ghost has been disoriented and believes that they are haunting Barnum's museum rather than Newell's farm, where they wish to be reinterred. The hotel patron yells at the elderly man, why you poor blundering old fossil, you have been haunting a plaster cast of yourself. The real Cardiff giant is in Albany. Confound it, don't you know your own remains? You have had all your troubles for nothing. You have been haunting a plaster cast of yourself. The real Cardiff giant is in Albany. The Cardiff giant was the inspiration for at least a dozen other hoaxes of a similar nature. It appears that the majority of people were motivated by ticket sales and the chance of making a quick sale for a significant amount of money. One of these was a rock known as the Solid Muldoon, which was discovered in the year 1876 close to Beulah, Colorado. It was most likely named after William Muldoon, a strongman and boxer. It was believed that P.T. Barnum owned the petrified remains of Muldoon's namesake, regardless of whether or not Barnum actually owns the remains. Barnum made an offer of $20,000 for the petrification, therefore endowing it with the approval of the great showman. A dissatisfied insider divulged the fact that the offender was none other than George Hull, the man responsible for creating the Cardiff giant. William Conant, a former employee of Barnum and Bailey, supported Hull in his scheme. The Muldoon was solid and comprised of a concoction of rocky dust, clay, plaster, ground bones, blood, and ground meal that had been kiln fired for several days. Othiel Lamarche, a professor at Yale, played the role that he had previously played in Cardiff by investigating the hoax and relegating it to the annals of scientific obscurity. The fact that Muldoon has a tail was a dead giveaway, and it's possible that the atheist Hull intended this to be a reference to Darwin. Additionally, giants were useful as a marketing gimmick. Two hotels on Lake Cayuga in New York were engaged in a fierce competition for patronage in the middle of the 1870s. These hotels were the Toganock House and the Cataract House. In the year 1877, the proprietor of the Toganock Hotel contracted with a local foundry worker to prepare a petrified man and then hide it in an area where workers expanding the road leading to the hotel would find it. They did, and as a result, Toganock House was visited by a large number of people. However, this sudden wealth with the hotel was simply a passing phase. While under the influence of alcohol, one of the people who assisted in burying the monster revealed its location, P.T. Barnum. It was said that P.T. Barnum's representative was among those there, and he swiftly left town after the event. Even worse, one of the primary components of the monster was iron fillings, and when these were exposed to air, they began to rust. The Cardiff giant, who had been relegated to a barn near Fitchburg, Massachusetts, made a brief appearance during the 1901 Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, but the event was a failure and garnered very little notice. It was purchased by a publisher in Des Moines, Iowa, but in 1947, he sold it to the Farmers Museum in Cooperstown. At the Farmers Museum, it is now on display beneath a tent that is an exact replica of the one that it was placed beneath when it was shown at Stubb Newell's Farm in October 1869. According to Ken Feeder, author of Frauds, Myths, and Mysteries, 2001, the most obvious explanation is that the Cardiff giant confirmed biblical stories of giants. Then there were people who probably knew better, the smart businessman in Syracuse. They saw that people were coming in to see the giant, using hotel space, and buying food. Another possibility, according to Ken Feeder, is that it is comparable to reading the National Enquirer in modern times. People went to see the Cardiff giant even if they truly didn't believe it because they thought it was interesting and were ready to spend 50 cents to do so. Somewhere between the two of them, George Hall and P.T. Barnum, it's likely that Barnum is still smiling at the Cardiff giant and that David Hunnam is thinking something along the lines of there's a sucker born every minute. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more upcoming videos.